Welcome to this episode of the Biology of Trauma podcast. I am your host, Dr. Amy. In this episode, we're answering the question, how can authenticity help us after trauma in developing the healing, intimate relationships we need? As you know, our body goes through hard experiences, and we need to learn how to complete our body's responses to those emotional shocks in order to stop carrying them. Trauma stored in our body is what leads to disease, symptoms, diagnoses. And yet when trauma blocks authenticity, can authenticity be used to help us regain connection? How do we even access our own authenticity? Why is it an important tool when it comes to relearning how to connect and interact with other people? My guest for this episode is none other than Dr. Peter Levine, the pioneering founder of Somatic Experiencing, who has over 50 years of experience in the field of trauma and how overwhelm, freeze, and shutdown get stored in our muscles and tissues, blocking authenticity. In this episode, you will learn about how trauma disrupts our authentic selves and impacts our relationships, the significance of authenticity and human connection when it comes to healing after trauma, how to achieve greater intimacy through uh, authenticity, and yet how a dysregulated nervous system impacts our ability to achieve our goals and strategies on how to manage this, the connection between flow state and authenticity, and finally the importance of authenticity and self-awareness and personal growth. I will also tell you a secret now. At the end of this episode, I have a surprise for you with two special guests I invited who have a special message for Dr. Peter Levine. Let's get started. When a person has undergone, just gone through life, right? Life, uh, because life has trauma that we lose our authentic self or we never even know who our authentic self is. And that journey back to authenticity, how important that is, because until we're authentic, we're, we're not even able to have a true connection with other people. Yes, exactly. I mean, I see this as beginning, at least initial, I mean, as babies, it has to do with being co-regulated by the other. That's how we get to know and learn about our internal experience, a beneficial uh, internal experience. And and then once, if we're fortunate enough to, be, to have this co-regulation, we can begin also to regulate ourselves. And um, when we can connect with ourselves, really rely on our felt experience, um, we develop a internal authenticity to be able to be with ourselves in this deeper embodied way. And I think that's about presence. And then if we take this gift, which we may have worked hard for, so it's not just the gift, but it's a gift plus work, then we can be present for another, to really be present with them. And uh, to know what that means, really what that means. So it means really if they're in deep pain or in shame, we don't recoil. We stay there. We stay present. They know that we're here with them, with ourselves and with them. And that allows them to be able to, to explore their their felt world. So I say authenticity is first connecting with self, being present with self, and then being present with the, with other. And that to me is authenticity. And when we don't have that, that connection with ourselves and the connection with other, we seem always to be out of sync with another person. So we're in a, say, an intimate relationship. Well, quote, intimate. And, uh, and say, just, how can there be intimacy without authenticity? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Right. But, you know, nothing works. You know, we just don't, we, we don't connect. We're frustrated. Then we wind up blaming the other person. Of course, that's never happened with me. Right. And, um, and again, that's, you know, most of that is just because, well, it's because trauma, but it's because we're unable to really be with ourselves, to be intimate 
with ourselves and therefore to be intimate with, with the other. Now, some people, you know, uh, or many people don't really connect with themselves. They don't see that as even a possibility for whatever reason. And, you know, they would maybe rather just sit on the couch and watch television. Um, but, um, so, so we just don't know what we don't know, you know, and that's in some ways the most challenging to be able to, to awaken, you know, to awaken to ourselves. And on the other hand, people who are traumatized, that causes a pr profound disconnection from the self. Dissociation is profound disconnection from the self. And um, so we, we're, we can't be present with ourselves and we can't be present with another. And again, if you think about it, two people in, a, in an intimate relationship that are both traumatized, that's all they're going to do is shut their traumas back and forth. You know, and again, it just, it, 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 the relationship is not healing. It's the opposite. Um, but when we're able to heal our own traumas, to resolve our traumatic ex experiences, then that process in itself, that transformation in itself, really takes us to who we are. It, it, it opens a portal to the self. And so again, trauma, when it can disconnect us from, from uh, authenticity, presence and authenticity, when we are able to really hold that in our awareness and move through the trauma, do the healing really that we can be supported and we need another to help support us with the trauma. That's essential. You know, somebody sent me a book or something like this to write a, uh, you know, a blurb for it. And I was thumbing through the book and I saw this um, quote and I said, oh my God, that's to I totally agree with this. Uh, they just say it is better than I could say it. Then I noticed the quote was from In an Unspoken Voice. It was your and own quote. <laughs> it was my own quote. It was great. Uh, you know, it's always, it's always a little bit funny. So um, what I what I wrote <laughs> was trauma is not what ha just what happens to us, but what we hold inside, in the absence of another empathetic or authentic person, an individual. And so, in healing trauma, we need to work with a catalyst, whether it's the therapist, the friend, the colleague, whatever, that really is authentic and can be with us in this core way so that we're connecting body to body, heart to heart, mind to mind. And, um, and that's authenticity restored. But again, it, often if it's an absence, that if it's really never been there or never considered to be something that's you know, of any particular use, we, we don't develop it. I mean, if you look around, 99% of what you see going on or watching the news or, you know, all of that kind of stuff. You see people that are unable to be present and you see a lot of strife that that causes, tremendous amount of strife. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I would say that authenticity is an important antidote for many of our ills as individuals, as communities, as countries. Really, again, I don't want to say this is the this is the solution but without it you know we're we have really nowhere to go yeah and i think of so many people peter who um have tried to have tried to analyze right like who am i what am i here and that's been their approach to trying to find their authentic self and yet what i hear you saying is that it really is that connecting with your inner self with the body sensations and what are I there know. And when you're able to do that, then when someone else is presenting with their internal body experiences, you're not going to be um, uncomfortable because it's bringing stuff up in you. You're yeah. going to be able to be with them as that's coming up for them. There's, I'm trying to think of it. There's, a, I think it's a quote from one of the 
Greek philosophers. Like the examined life is not worth living. Something like that. The unexamined life is not worth living. Mm-hmm. Is not worth living. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And but I would take that a step further. The unfelt life is not worth examining, and therefore not worth living. So that's I think the elusive thing that that uh, uh, you know uh, affects people. Uh, you know without really even knowing it. I mean, as I say, so many people, I mean, just walking around the street, you know, in a way, um, really learning to read bodies as a skill I, you know, developed in myself for 45 years. uh, In some ways, I kind of, at times, I wish that I could turn it off, you know, because when I'm walking, and I see thousands and thousands and thousands, I mean, walking around in the street or like in New York City or in Penn Station or whatever. Um, it's difficult to see mm-hmm. how disconnected people are. You know, it was just the other day, there was a street fair down, down the street from where I live here in, in Encinitas. And so we went down and kind of everybody was hustling their, their wares and so forth. Uh, but what I, I didn't quite realize until we got to one little stall and there was this Kenyan kid guy, lovely, lovely. Immediately we started a conversation. He'd spent time, some time living in Switzerland, so we could relate to that. But he was so joyful. He was so present. We just stayed around there and just hung out with him and, of course, eventually bought a couple of things. Uh, but, you know, to see that, such a difference. And you notice it when you have something to compare it to. Yeah. So one thing, Peter, that I'd lo- that I'd love maybe for you to, to try to share is what what is it that you see that informs you through the through the eyes that you have now of being able to read people's nervous systems <laughs> through their through their body, body language, their movement, all of that. What is it that you see? Because I I guarantee you that most people don't even know yet that they are living that disconnected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, when you're in the disconnected state, things are fragmented. The bodies uh, walk in a jerky, uncoordinated way. You know, the difference between all the people in all those other stalls and this young man from Kenya was that his body was in flow. When he talked and he moved, it was with his whole body. Mm-hmm. The other people, more or less, mostly, were talking from here up. And so that experience of flow is something we all yearn for. We may not know we're yearning for it. We may not even know it's something we can yearn for. But to be in flow, to be in, in internal harmony and in harmony with others. Again, this man was clearly uh, in you know, in contact with his deep self. I don't think he would have even used those words. Um, And we immediately connected. So we met with our authenticity. Mm -hmm. And when I see people walking, and they're walking as though they were robots, mechanically, uh, awkwardly, uh, and then you see one person who's walking with flow and grace, you know, it's a world of difference. You know, one of the countries that I spent a fair amount of time in was uh, Brazil. And one of the things I loved about Brazil is that there was a lot of flow. There was a lot of this kind of movement. You know, on almost any street corner in the downtown area, some people were dancing with each other. You know, um, and you could just, even though my Portuguese was pretty meager, uh, you know, uh, it was it was easily possible to carry on a conversation because it was the language of the body, the unspoken language of the body that was communicating, you know, bet- between us. Mm-hmm. So, and, and I miss that. I, I I really miss that. And you know, I hope in my later years I'll be able to get to spend a little bit more time in countries where people are more spiritful, more heartful, and because it really you don't realize. You know, what the milieu you're in, the fish does or does not know it's in water, 
you know, if you're in a, in a world, in a society where almost everybody is like that, you don't really notice that there's something different, right. that there's something possible that's different. And again, you use the word authenticity. And at first, I, I was a little nervous about that, but I think it's a good term. It really is a good term if we understand that authenticity is about being present, it's about presence, <laughs> being present with ourselves in our bodies, in our guts, in our heart, and therefore being able to be present with others. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's authentic communication. And when you communicate with somebody, even if you have a disagreement, you're able to communicate through, you're able to, you know, find, uh, you know, a common ground. It may take a little bit, but, you know, it's there. So it, again, it's like the basis, the foundation for human relationship. Uh, what I hear you also saying is that without that authenticity, without that connection with self, we're not going to have that attunement and that flow with someone else that will really meet those core needs of ours as human beings to connect yeah. with somebody. That's right. And to connect with somebody and connect, I mean, in, in a deeper in a deeper way. Right. I mean, you know, in a, in a deeper things, way than just a conversation. <laughs> exactly. And what, you know, I, I try to do sometimes, especially if I'm not in a rush, you know, when I'm in a, in the supermarket buying, um, buying food, you know, I go to the checkout counter and I think, my gosh, this is a person who's been doing this, who'll be doing this eight hours a day. So I can get the food, the good food that I need for my sustenance. So I really should be grateful. I am grateful to them. So I'll start to try to, you know, feel in my, that like if they have a name, an unusual name, or they're clearly an accent from another country, I kind of use that as the basis for starting a conversation and then seeing if that conversation can flow and can go into a little bit deeper levels. So kind of looking for a, an entry, an entry, and engaging the person at least at some level and seeing, oh, it's like a dance. It really is. It's like a dance. You know, a while ago, I was um, taking tango lessons, kind of um, dancing with my partner, and it was so awkward and so so frustrating, truly frustrating. But then after a while, something would happen and our bodies would meet and flow. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, it's like we, were, we knew that we were, we were being authentic with each other. It took a lot of work, a lot of really, really, really hard work. But again, just that moment when you know it's possible and you know there can be more of it. Yeah. And I um, am thinking, you know, what you've, um, especially out in Arizona, when we were out in Sedona together and, right. and it was these conversations around like, what is it that you really want in life? Mm -hmm. And I see that this inability to be fully present for yourself in life really is what holds a lot of people back then from being able yeah. to get what they want in life because their nervous system is just doesn't have the capacity right. for right. that. Yeah. Well, listen, I'm not going to argue with you about that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think, but you said it very nicely, elegantly, really, in a way, when you said, what, we, what do you want in life? And there's one answer, but many, many, many answers, but there's only one real answer, and that is presence and authenticity. Mm -hmm. And what else is there? Mm -hmm. So it's not a thing. I mean, some people think, oh, I want to have a really big house, nice big house. That's fine. It's nice to have a house, nice to have a good house. I really want a really fancy sports car. Well, okay, you know, you're having a midlife crisis, fine, go ahead, enjoy it. Uh, but all of those, of course, are superficial. And I think our deepest yearning is for connection. You know, there's a Sufi saying, pilgrim, your yearning is what you're yearning for. 
And again, I think to connect with this yearning and to let to take the to, to let the yearning take us towards presence and connection and authenticity. And that for me, like you're describing truly to be alive, right? Not, not, al- just, not just living, but actually to be living alive requires yeah, to be that alive, presence. Right. To be alive and real. That's it. Mm-hmm. To be alive and to have and substance so that when people connect with you, they feel like they feel like they've had a true connection of substance rather than just this yeah. superficial kind of like, right. you know, chest, right. chest up. We've had a conversation, but a true I connection. Know. Yeah, that presence that requires. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you know, it's fascinating me actually because I'm doing a lot of this Zoom stuff. Is that it's actually possible? It takes a little bit more effort, a little bit more trying. That even you know, with the Zoom, we're able to find connection and find in you know interpersonal flow. Very good. Well, I have uh, I have a surprise guest for you, and actually um, two surprise guests for you. So I'm going to let them in right now. I know. Oh, okay. <laughs> There's one of my favorites. Yes. Welcome, Doctor Aileen and Laura. Hi. I invited them to briefly share something with you, Peter. So okay. Yeah, <laughs> Doctor Aileen, why don't you go first? Oh my goodness. Yeah. You know, it's, it's just always such a pleasure to reflect on the importance of your work, Peter. And I don't think I ever told you how I got to know about your work. Mm. And, Mm -hmm. and I, I thought this is interesting because it was 1994 and 1994 was the Northridge, big LA Northridge earthquake. And there were a group of us here in L.A., and it's like after the Northridge earthquake, the ground was shaking like every day, constantly, and we were all like totally nervous. And so myself and two colleagues, we we heard about your work. You were teaching a workshop in San Diego, and we drove down. We knew nothing about you. Just this person, Peter Levine, is teaching about trauma. And so the three of us drove down and did the workshop, and it completely changed our lives because my two colleagues were Maggie Klein and Raja Selvam Uh and myself. So, of course, Maggie. I remember. Yeah. 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 So, of course, Maggie and Raja became your faculty. And I was in training at the time in psychoanalytic training, and it cued me in to start thinking about trauma in terms of developmental issues. Mm -hmm. Yes. So here we are. That day, that workshop changed all the three of us, our lives. Wow. Well, thank you. That warms my heart. (laughs) And, and you know, that's talk about thing. authentic communication. <laughs> right. And you know, the thing that is so amazing about somatic experiencing is that I've heard that so often, you know, therapists or even people who come to neuroaffective touch is that they say, you know, somatic experiencing is absolutely a watershed in their lives, yeah. that there's the there's who they were as therapists before SC and who they then become mm-hmm. after they've taken the training. So mm-hmm. yeah, thank Whoa, you wow. for sharing that. But you know, one of the things I think that's somewhat unique it, uh, about SC is that it teaches people to do how they do what they do. So somebody who's a psychoanalyst uh, it helps them really deepen the psycho psychoanalytic dialogue. Right. You know, uh, a psychologist, a psychiatrist, whatever, re- or a, a, you know, a, a hospital worker or other healthcare provider. All of these are really help them deepen the work that they they already do. Right. So it's not like a it's not like a training like CBT or something where you get a kind of certification. But it really is about learning these fundamental embodiment skills, certainly related to trauma, but not exclusively about trauma. 
Yes. <laughs> well, I have a, a story. And anyway, Aileen's story kind of triggered my story. And I thought, I thought I'd tell you how I got to somatic experiencing. I was up at Esalen Institute in 2000. Yeah. And I was hanging out with Ariel Doretto in a workshop. Oh, yeah. And it was a really wacky workshop. I forget the name of the, the teacher that was teaching. But um, about a few months later, she called me up and she goes, you know, I'm going to Brazil and I'm, I'm following this amazing guy, Peter Levine. I'm like, oh, no, you following another guru. Oh, gee, here she goes again, another one. You know, and then she says, you need to come down to Brazil with me. I'm like, I don't think so. Oh, and I, she first assisted you in Brazil when the first time right. you went there. Yep. I think that's when you were starting to develop the energy wells. Yeah, yeah. And so I, um, a couple of years later, I, I joined and I regret that I didn't listen to her suggestion right away. But so she's the person that introduced me and she's now one of your faculty members as well. And yeah. Um, yeah. when I joined, I was really in a crisis for my, for my own self. I had had six psychotherapists doing a lot of talk therapy. And, and I was struggling with relationships and, and attachment and stuff. And I got into SE and I did it for myself. And I kept just doing one module at a time. And Maggie, Maggie Klein was my teacher, uh, right? And then Raja Selman right. was my second year teacher. Right. Oh, goodness. Just, what a circle, yes. right? So we, I worked a lot for my own self. I had a very good and successful bodywork training at bodywork um mm -hmm practice, but I was doing it for myself. And then over time, I was getting more and more regulated and more understanding of my own self, which then changed my, my body work practice, you yeah. know, hugely. And I, re then I became coordinator and I remember how committed you were to not splitting the body workers from the psychotherapists, from the right. analysts and the MFDs that I thought, and so what everyone was like, you've got to you know, you got to split us up. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, you were separate ones for each. Yeah. And you were insistent on, and I just so admire that you stuck to your guns with with all that kind of pushback. Yeah, right. And there was plenty of that pushback. That is. Yeah. Yeah. And here we well, are today. Yeah, exactly. So wonderful, wonderful, wonderful to see you guys again. Yes. And. Uh, it's a real it's a real honor to get to say this little hello and and this opportunity to give you our appreciation. Yeah. Well, I'm just touched. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for tuning into this episode of the Biology of Trauma podcast. My favorite quote from Dr. Levine. There's only one real answer and that is presence and authenticity. And what else is there? Mm. Our greatest desire as humans is to feel like we've had a true connection, something of substance rather than just a superficial conversation, to be loved and to love. And these relationships are both our greatest challenge after trauma and the greatest medicine and healer. If any of this resonated with you around authenticity and attachment, I have put together a guide on the attachment trauma roadmap and the steps for healing. This is a guide for you to understand the different elements that we need to integrate on that healing journey, specifically from attachment trauma, because it requires that integration given all of its impact on our body. I also want to let you know that for me, one of the, one of the real tools and resources that I've been able to use is uh, what I call neck support. You will learn this in the foundational journey, but I provide that for myself through this weighted neck scarf. And what this does is that when I, when I wear it and it has these touch points on my neck, so it's, it's actually accessing my brain stem and those limbic regions. For me, it gives me that felt sense of oh, being loved. You can see that I just had a deep, spontaneous breath as soon as I put that on. And for me, with that attachment insecurity that my body can carry and be triggered with, it's so helpful to have this as a tool that I use to create for myself that felt sense of safety and being loved. So this might be something that you'll consider. And I have the link for this in the show notes as well. If you'd like to listen to other podcasts related to authenticity and connection with others, 
as well as somatic work, you'll want to go find episode 67 and episode 80. Episode 67 was on healing trauma and chronic illness through connection. And episode 80 was on breaking toxic patterns, why we choose and stay in unhealthy relationships after complex trauma. If you could please take a minute to leave a review for this Biology Trauma podcast. I spend time dedicating myself to bringing you valuable, practical information and your, your feedback, your reviews help me bring more of what is valuable to you. So please take that moment and leave a review. I'm your host, Dr. Amy. And until next episode, lots of love.